Welcome back, Steel Maniacs. Yes, that's right, you heard me. Today, we are delving into Steel Mania. But before we start, be sure to like, share and subscribe so you don't miss an update. Steel Mania, the very mention of it may fill some of you with confusion, others, nostalgia. But what is Steel Mania? Is it relevant today? Or is it just another relic of the past that I so enjoy talking about here on the channel? Steel Mania, otherwise known as Proper Gaming, was first identified in Nigel Stillman whilst working for Games Workshop in the mid-90s. As Patient Zero, he would present with the symptoms of obsessing over tiny details, such as giving every character a name and storied history. Never changing his army list, even in the face of certain defeat. Taking the time to model every magic item, no matter how minor, amongst many others. In short, Stillmania is an ethos, a philosophy, if you will, of how to play and how you should play at miniature wargaming. Stillmania has garnered quite a following online over the years. Indeed, it has become somewhat endemic in some factions of the wargaming fraternity. Given Lead featured the full gamut of articles gleaned from half a decade of White Dwarf in glorious full colour, whilst analysing the outputs and even interviewing the man himself. Whilst here on the channel, I hope to give the notion further airtime by covering each of the expansive articles in detail. As relevant now as it ever was, Stillmania harkens back to an age of imagination and creativity quite unlike that which we are familiar with today. I, for one, know of few young people that put pen to paper anymore instead realising their deepest thoughts in godless digital forms like TikTok and Instagram. Stillmania thus was a distillation of decades of wargaming. When it came to the first instalment, Nigel had already been playing games longer than he cared to remember. So, who better than to explain the intricacies and pitfalls involved in collecting an entire army than the man himself. Raising an army. Collecting an army may seem to be a simple, straightforward process, and players are often told, when you have collected your army, you... Dot, dot, dot. Collecting an army is not a preliminary to gaming, like setting up the table. It is nine-tenths of the hobby. Assembling an army is an enjoyable and challenging task, but it is also a long-term project requiring a strategy and the determination to see it through. What follows is one approach to collecting an army from scratch, bit by bit. It is the approach I tend to adopt after experience of collecting many armies. It is a very disciplined and methodical approach and won't suit everybody, but it's a plan that gets the job done. I have a Warhammer army in mind as I describe the process, but the general principles will apply to the forces required for other games. Note, it is worth noting that we are talking about the early editions of Warhammer when I mention points values and character allowances. However, the principles are still entirely valid. So, which army? Some players stumble at the first hurdle. Which army should I collect and seek the opinion of veteran gamers? Others commit themselves with an impulse buy. In many ways, the latter are on the right track. Go for the army that attracts you most, for whatever reason. Whether you just like the race or culture, or you respect their fighting qualities 
as described in the rules. Ask yourself this question. If I were suddenly transported into the Warhammer world by a wizard, whose army would I rather end up in? If you know you are a goblin at heart, don't collect an elf army. Identity crisis is not a good basis for a long-term plan to collect an army. Stand by your tribe. When you have decided who to identify with in the Warhammer world, absorb the background information about the culture of your chosen army. Collecting an army is a long-term project. Changing your mind is the way to end up with no proper army at all, doomed forever to be the ally of someone else with a sword contingent of rogues. Adopt your army and stay loyal to it through victory and defeat. Through consistency, you will achieve mastery. Every defeat is like a swordsmith hammering a blade, battering and honing it into a deadly weapon. The recruitment plan. Model soldiers don't generally volunteer. So there are two methods of recruitment, levy en masse or the draft. The former is where you buy the army in one go, or at least large parts of it. Then your problem is just getting it painted. The latter is where you recruit a unit or a few models at a steady rate. This method of recruitment is best for play as you learn the approach to gathering the army. In this way, you can change your mind in the light of experience gained by playing with your army before it reaches maximum size. If you levied your army en masse, then you are stuck with it and may feel like reorganising it from time to time by disbanding and reforming units and replacing some all together as you evolve your tactics on the games table. The draft is much better for recruiting an army as you purchase a few models at a time and paint as you go along. You can set yourself an attainable target such as adding a unit every week, buy them at the beginning of the week and have them painted and ready to fight by the end of it. If they are not ready, the next week's draft is cancelled and the time devoted to finishing the last lot. Stick to this plan and there will be no backlog of unpainted models. The army will grow surprisingly quickly and you will gain a feeling of achievement and satisfaction. Follow the plan as if it was a religious duty. Thus, December is now month of recruiting archers in your amazing new calendar. Recruit by division. An army of 3,000 points is a big army. It is the classic army that is so often referred to in the rules and used in battle reports. You will probably want to have an army of that size as the end result of your efforts. In order to have a choice of units, the total points value of your collection is finally likely to be nearer 4,000 points. It seems like a daunting task to collect this number of troops. You will most certainly need a plan. The secret is to recruit by divisions. An army of 1,000 points is perfectly good for a small battle, and it is also a division of the greater army. The plan, therefore, is not to collect a single big army of 3,000 points, but three small armies of 1,000 points each, which combine together as divisions of the greater army. So, in six months you will have your first division, and by the end of the year, a respectable army of 2,000 points. Now you can stop there, or go for a third or fourth division and the mega army. It doesn't matter if you stop after 1,000 points, 
or 2,000 points, you will have a useful finished army at that point. Then, if you change army, you will have an ally contingent or a reserve force. If you change your mind back again, just carry on collecting the remaining divisions of the original army. The Army List Your reference and guide for collecting your army is its accompanying Warhammer Armies book. The background tells you about the race or culture, while the army list and special rules translate the background description into troops. The game is more interesting when lots of different armies with varied ways of fighting are pitched against each other. So the list is meant to make sure that each of the Warhammer races is different and have their own style of fighting and special characters. The army lists won't let you have everything in your army. Or, in other words, the army lists won't allow players to make the game bland and boring. Within the limitations of the list, there is enormous room for interpretation. The lists are very flexible and impose few restrictions within what is appropriate to the army concerned. This means that several players using the same list could choose several very different armies. One army might emphasize shooting, another mounted troops, whilst another war machines. When working out units from the list, you can choose your own emphasis. Pick units which suit your preferred tactics, or modeling tastes for that matter, and ignore others. Instead of, or before, working out the whole of your projected mega army of 3000 points, determine the theme for your army. The theme is either an overriding tactical doctrine, such as mobility or firepower, or something less tangible, such as monsters or characters, or red and black. The theme can be kept in mind for the whole army, or just one division. So, for example, a high elf army with a theme of defence would perhaps feature numerous regiments of spearmen and warriors. This could contrast with the more obvious theme of shootiness and therefore mark your army out as an individual interpretation of the culture. A quick look at the background for the High Elves will show that you were entirely justified and have created none other than the Menthius army. Citizens from Kothik and Trace who formed a corps of spearmen and archers and broke the siege at Griffin's Gate. If you wanted to hedge your bets tactically, then you could opt for three divisions of 1,000 points, one emphasising defence, one emphasising shootiness, and one emphasising mobility. Lo and behold, an army of three realms, which have joined forces to beat off the foe. Collecting by division and using themed divisions does not commit you to fighting all your battles for a year with 1,000 points of archers because your first choice of division was a shooty one. The first division could perhaps emphasize an all-round task force or the general's elite retinue and contain various units and models. Once you start later divisions, you can reinforce, mix or swap units in the first division with those in the division you are currently collecting. Note, incidentally, if you have been diligently painting as you recruit, your second 1000 points will be infinitely better painted than your first. It's a phenomenon worth bearing in mind. Perhaps you should regard your first 1000 points as your practice points in terms of playing and painting. Here we can dimly perceive a task that will come after the completion of your final 1000 points. Go back to your first batch and give them a thorough overhaul. What's in the division? Think of a division 
as a mini army of 1000 points. If you follow the proportions of points allowed to be spent on characters, regiments, etc. for each 1000 points, you will have the correct proportions when you have 3000 points. The mini army needs a general. Choose a suitable character model to be included in your 1000 points. Later on when you have 2000 or 3000 points you might use the same model as a hero having acquired a better candidate for general. The basic principle is to include one independent character model for each batch of 1000 points. You will thus account for up to 50% of your 1000 points with this model. The rest of the division is made up of regiments, war machines or monsters. The proportions allowed by the army list are likely to permit one big or two small units, one war machine and or one monster. As an example of what you might come up with, let's apply the plan to a dark elf army. I imagine I'm setting out to collect a mega 3000 points army. Stage 1 is to collect my first 1000 points. Recognising and admitting to my irrational attraction to witch elves, which has led to my choice of army, I decide to go with it and make witch elves the theme of my first division. I will satiate my desire to paint hordes of these models before dealing with the rest of the army. There will be other things in this initial batch, but it will emphasise witch elves. I need a general. This should be either a character who could be the general of the final 3000 points, or who will eventually take second place as a hero or powerful sorcerer when I finally settle on a general. I decide to go for a fairly cheap general on cold one. As my army expands he will be moved down to say a hero of some cold one knights. Let's get to grips with regiments next. Keeping to the theme a regiment of witch elves is in order and I fancy a big one. Now I'm going to follow my rule for raising regiments explained later and start with the command group. That is the standard leader and musician. I decide to have all three and that the leader will be a champion. I want a big unit so I will need a further 27 witch elves to go with the command group making 30 in all. Now would be the time to look at war machines and monsters. I can't afford both, so I decide to leave monsters for the next division. I will definitely want bolt throwers in this army, so I might as well get one in the first batch. Another regiment would not go amiss, especially in this core division of the army. I decide on Black Ark Corsairs because I dimly perceive an overall theme for the final army as a horde floating on a black arc, striking anywhere in the Warhammer world. And I also want to paint monster hide cloaks for the real reason. Ignoring options for the moment, I go for a command group of champion, standard and musician. There is still room for the champion in the character allowance. A unit of 20 will do for now. That's it then, a plan for the first 1000 points. After taking into account magic items and other options. I've decided to get 5 witch elves or black arc corsairs a week and not get the next 5 until I've painted the first 5. Because using unpainted models is despicable. When I've completed the 2 units I'll deal with the bolt thrower and the character in that order, allowing myself as long as it takes to paint or model the general before drafting the next 
1000 point division. Estimated time before this batch is ready to fight is 10 weeks, plus another 4 for the war machine and character. 14 weeks. Can I keep my interest up that long? Yes, because it will take 3 times as long to collect the full 3000 points, and I love my hobby. Am I a here today, gone tomorrow, power gaming anorakai? No, I am a grim Nagarothai who will not be deterred from his avowed purpose. We must all decide for ourselves the meaning of life, or be lost and adrift. Note, building your army by division is a great way of learning the plans and tactics involved with your chosen race. By playing small battles as you gather your forces, you learn how to use each war machine or regiment as you go along. You can have great games even with a fairly small army. For example, the Bridge of Doom in White Dwarf 183 only had 1,500 points on each side, but Jake and Gavin still had a real battle on their hands. Allies, don't expect any reasonable compromise from me, because you won't get one. I have never used allies. My armies always fight alone. I have never been very enthusiastic about the custom of using allies in an army, for the very reason that it appeals to everyone who wants to win at all costs. When an army has inspired me enough to collect it, paint it, and fight with it, I consider it a matter of pride to persevere in the face of all defeats until I start winning well-deserved victories with it. I don't immediately turn round asking for allies after the first defeat. Oh dear, no cavalry in this dwarf army, better get some elf allies then. My dwarfs will just set their grudges on one side, won't they? Oh dear, no artillery in this Bretonian army. Better get some empire or dwarf allies then. My Bretonians will just have to choke on their honour so that I can win. As I have said before, such behaviour can be shown scientifically to be related to frequent bad dice rolls. In my view, one should choose allies in the spirit of the army concerned and not just to concoct the most effective battle-winning combination of troop types. A good example of an alliance in the true spirit of the army concerned would be an empire army with dwarf allies. Firstly, it cannot be accused of being a contrived alliance to gain troop types not otherwise allowed, since the empire has infantry and artillery which are also the main strengths of the dwarfs. What such an alliance does do is strengthen these very aspects of the Empire army. So, the combined force is twice as good at what they are individually good at. The general's tactical doctrine will be doubly as effective. This is how a real alliance works on the battlefield. It is difficult for forces with divergent tactical ideas to work together on the same battlefield. When such alliances exist, the allied armies actually operate better as separate armies under their own generals, attacking the same enemy from different directions, usually on different battlefields. Secondly, the alliance is not only believable, but probable and also a fairly common occurrence. Dwarves live in the Empire. They help to build the Empire artillery. Dwarf contingents would not be difficult for the Empire general to recruit. The best way to represent an alliance between two of the great nations of the Warhammer world is for two players, each with their own army, to get together rather than to include ally contingents in 
a single army. The enemy will either be a single player with a truly colossal army or a similar alliance of two players. This mirrors the reality. Nations which may not have much in common and may not even like each other forge an alliance against a common enemy which they both detest and which threatens to destroy them both. So Bretonians and Wood Elves do not by choice like to fight together on the same side. Wood Elves hate Bretonian arrogance and Bretonians dislike elf cunning and feel dishonoured by the preponderance of bows. However, both nations detest the undead and the orcs even more than each other. I like both armies as a player, but I respect their wishes when I fight with them and will not upset my Bretonians by including tricky elves in the army. Can you imagine the post-defeat recriminations? We would have won if your impetuous knights had not charged. You spoiled the plan, says the wood elf. The Bretonian, about to draw his sword in anger, replies, Why were you skulking in the woods when we were fighting the enemy in honourable hand-to-hand combat? I slew six orcs personally. All the arrows of your folk barely slew two goblins. By the way, why did your scouts run away when they saw our squires falling back? Call yourself brave, do you? How to raise regiments. Thus, it was in former days, and so it is true today. And so too is it doubly true in the Warhammer world. The standard was the very spirit of the regiment. If the regiment fights to the last man, it is his duty to save the standard or prevent it falling to the enemy. If the enemy capture it, they'll parade it in triumph. The standard is the symbol of the regiment. Did you think a regiment's banner just a bit of rag, a cutout and photocopy ornament, or an easy way of getting the unit a plus one combat resolution bonus? Oh, how wrong you are. The first model to collect when raising a unit is the standard bearer. A unit without a standard bearer is no more than a skirmisher detachment or band of scouts. When you have the standard, you can add as many models as you wish. The standard bearer standing on your shelf, even if he is alone, is saying, here there was once a regiment and here it can rise again. Next is the leader. This model can be upgraded to a champion or better. Then comes the musician, which is more of an option, although I will have one purely on artistic grounds. It looks good and, in my experience, a regiment that looks good attracts good dice scores. The standard bearer, leader and musician together constitute the command group. You can add as many or as few troopers to them as you wish. You can go so far as to have several command groups for a particular troop type, allowing you to split a large regiment up into several units, from one battle to the next. Regiments without some semblance of a command group, though permitted in the lists for the sake of an individual's right to be mediocre, are slapdash and are the root cause of any bad dice throws you have. Like attracts like and good luck is attracted to well-painted miniatures. Note, the biggest problem with raising by division is that it limits the maximum you can spend on any one character to 500 points. Now, this might not necessarily be a bad thing, but some armies, notably Chaos and Undead, have some extremely expensive characters. Nagash costs 750 points, and some Chaos Lords can easily notch up over 1,000 points. With such powerful characters, 
I usually paint them up as a separate division in their own right, spending a long time to achieve the best possible finish on such fine citadel miniatures. The points cost of these characters can then be offset by including a high proportion of regiments in the next division. Creativity. The first question to ask yourself is, have I chosen the right army after all? So, for example, if you are a dwarf player but lament the lack of cavalry, could it be that you are not really a true dwarf after all? Perhaps you should consider another army. If you are more than lukewarm about dwarfs and you choose them because you like the culture and the dwarf way, and not just because you picked up a ready-painted dwarf army that fell off the back of a lorry or something, then you will persevere and discover proper dwarf tactics. After painting comes modelling, as a skill which every civilised person should acquire. It is enough to try, you can only get better. If you want to express a very individual interpretation of your army, and the models don't seem to cooperate, try converting them. Change weapons, shields, heads, or whatever you like. It may be that you want to create a character using the list, perhaps riding a monster, and such a model does not exist. The answer is, find the models that can be converted into what you have in mind, and have a go. There are modelling articles in White Dwarf and modelling guidebooks to help you out with ideas and techniques. Remember the experts who are sharing their knowledge had to find it out for themselves years ago, in a far more primitive age. The grim darkness of the 70s and 80s, and without anyone to show them the way. Shame on a new and advantaged generation if they cannot do half as well. A note on bases. You are a free individual and you can paint or decorate your bases as you wish. At the studio we use green because it answers our needs regarding photography. You are liberated from such constraints the main thing to bear in mind is that the base should emphasise the model, not detract from it. Green tends to show up the model very well. Other colours you might try are sand colour or grey. A rough texture usually works well on bases, as does a very matte finish to the base. This makes the base look like the ground and reflects the light differently causing the figure to stand out. So, that's my guide to collecting an army. It's only a guide, but what are you waiting for? Your force awaits thee. That just about wraps up the first of the Stillmania articles. With it in mind, I encourage you to take some of this valuable knowledge into your own wargaming. Join me next time for some more wargaming content. Thanks very much for watching. Peace.